Guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Peter Milan. I'm a professional shooter out of Cape Town, South Africa. I'm extremely fortunate to be able to do this for a living. You guys absolutely love part one of this video, so I thought, hey, let me put together part two with some of your favorite movies that you left me in the comments on part one of this video. Make sure you check that out by clicking up here or in one of the links down below in the video description. Having said that, these videos I make are completely for fun. Don't take them too seriously. If you feel the need to leave a negative comment, you're probably taking it too seriously. So without further ado, what movies will we be looking into today? Gemini Man, Hurt Locker, Jack Reacher, The Accountant, Enemy at the Gates, and obviously, Saving Private Ryan. So without further ado, let's roll the intro. Make sure you do subscribe while that plays, and I'll see you guys on the other side. Saving Private Ryan is probably one of my favorite war movies. There's two iconic sniper scenes in Saving Private Ryan. The first one, we have a look at Vin Diesel's character. He's down, the enemy sniper's in the clock tower. We have the good guy sniper trying to take him out. They already know where he is at. The enemy sniper is trying to use Vin as bait to try and identify where the good guy sniper is. Now, as he sort of pans around the battlefield, he actually sees the good guy sniper aiming at him and he sees the muzzle flash and the bullet proceeds to fly straight through his optic and he gets the kill. Now, maybe back in the day with the cheap optics that would have happened. They've actually tested this on Mythbusters. I don't think they did a great job at it. Anyway, if this video gets 30,000 likes, okay, 30000, I will take this PST Gen 2 from Vortex Optics and put around with a modern caliber straight down the middle of this objective lens. So make sure you smash the like button on this video and make sure you are subscribed if you have not done so already. In the next sniper scene from Saving Private Ryan, our good guy is up in the tower shooting left-handed, but somehow as he's shooting, he's manipulating his rifle's bolt across the rifle like this. Now, I don't think that's the most efficient way of doing this, those rifles back in the day were pretty light, so you could just man up a little bit, let go of your support hand, and manipulate that bolt to chamber the next round and put rounds down range. Now, I see him hitting people, and there's a whole bunch of smoke coming out of them. I thankfully never had to shoot a person, but I don't think that smoke comes out of them once you do shoot them. I've harvested a lot of animals, and I can tell you what, they don't smoke once you shoot them. If you're enjoying the video so far, make sure you leave a comment down below with your top five sniper movies. Maybe we missed some and we can pick that up in a later video. Anyway, moving swiftly along to our next movie. Gemini Man came out recently starring Will Smith. I am a massive Will Smith fan, so I pretty much watch anything Will's in. And in this movie, you get two of Will, so that's pretty cool. So Gemini Man starts out with Will setting up his shooting position on a hillside. His target is approaching him on a speeding bullet train. Will also has an accomplice slash spotter on the train, giving him the speed that the train is moving at via GPS. This will allow Will's character to work out the lead or how much he would have to aim in front of the train in layman's terms in order for once the bullet is in flight to actually line up correctly with his target and make a successful impact. So guys, one thing to note, if you're not a shooter, we have to dial our elevation turrets and our windage turrets if we're doing shots like this. So if he knows what speed the train is traveling at, he would more than likely be dialing in that speed on his windage turret. Now elevation turret he would use to compensate for the falling of the bullet. So he's ranged the sort of where the tunnel is at about 1,240 meters. And you'll see him adjusting that on his elevation turret. And that's pretty much gonna make sure that where you aim on the center of your crosser is gonna line up with where that bullet's gonna fall. Now to determine that, that's a whole different story. I have done a separate video on that, which you can check out here if you're interested in that at all. So something I really liked about this movie is that Will actually uses a Kestrel. Now this is a ballistic calculator that we use in long range shooting all the time. It accounts for wind, it accounts for drop, Something to note, maybe they just didn't show this correctly, is that when you use this device for measuring wind, you want to be pointing it into the wind so it gives you the correct direction of wind because the direction of the wind has a big influence on how it's going to affect the bullet downrange. So maybe they just didn't show us that correctly. Judging from how the vegetation is moving behind him, he definitely doesn't point his Kestrel into the right direction to get a correct wind call. 
One thing I like to do as a long range shooter is to always make sure that my rifle is as solid as possible. So I would never, like he does in this case, rest my rifle on top of my shooting mat with the bipod. I would put that bipod into the grass, make sure it's firm and that my position behind that rifle is rock solid, that you couldn't potentially experience any jump or a potential shift in zero because of how your rifle is standing on a mat. Given how nuts this shot is, I'm surprised his character didn't try a 360 no scope. Before we jump into the next movie, I want to give a massive shout out to our channel sponsor, Modular Driven Technologies, MDTTech.com, make a beautiful chassis like you guys see behind me. That's their ESS, the Elite Sniper System. Simply awesome, available for multiple different bolt action rifles. Guys, make sure you head on over to MDTTech.com to shop their amazing selection of bolt action chassis systems. You won't regret it. To see more pictures of my beautiful rifle systems and check me out in action, make sure you follow me on Instagram at Impact Shooting or just click on the first link down below. Now, let's jump into the famous Hurt Locker sniper scene, shall we? Well, no one's counting. This job never finishes. So the guys are out in the desert, somebody takes a round to the back and then you actually hear the gunshot go off. Now that is very accurate and something that they get wrong in movies all the time. Because when you're shooting a bullet that's supersonic, in other words, it's flying faster than the speed of sound, the bullet will reach its target before the sound of the gun going off. So that's very accurate. You will hear the bullet hitting whatever the object is, and then later you'll hear the gunshot. Similar, we have this experience when we're shooting steel. We'll shoot the steel, you can see it moving and everything, and then a few seconds later you'll hear cling. And anybody that's shot some steel at distance knows what a cool experience that is to see the target swinging and then to hear that audible feedback a few seconds later. That's super sweet and very satisfying. So after their initial hustle and bustle, they get settled in, they break out the big 50 cal. Now what I really like about this scene, besides the fact that the guy's shooting his 50 cal with no hearing protection. Okay, so to put this into perspective, you guys are gonna like this. This is a 308 Winchester round, okay? This is the casing or the shell of a 50 BMG round. Okay. That says a lot. There's a lot of powder in there. They're shooting a rifle with a muzzle brake. It's gonna make a hell of a lot of noise. You're more than likely have permanent hearing damage, singing ears for weeks, days beyond this. So yeah, that's something to note. The other thing I quite like about how they've done this, the muzzle blast seems pretty realistic. As that shot goes off, every time there's a big cloud of dust at the shooter's location, which is very accurate because it will kick up a ton of dust because there's a lot of gas exiting that muzzle and being deflected by the muzzle brake. Now the goal of the muzzle brake is to have the rifle recoil less, however it does make the rifle louder and more concussive to the people around you, so that is something to note. So there's pros and cons to running that, but on a big 50 like this, you're more than likely want a muzzle brake. The other thing I like about the scene is the bullet flight seems realistic. The shot goes off, and it takes a while for the bullet to go down range and hit its target or close to the target. The other thing I really like is when we shoot long range, we don't hit all our targets always. We do miss. Now, what's really cool about this scene is they don't show the guy like in every single movie that we've seen or every other movie where the guy just goes cling, 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 and he basically picks off all his targets one shot after the other. This, these guys are actually missing, which makes it a bit more realistic. And what's very important for us is when we miss, and if you're a competent shooter, you can use that information where your bullet has actually landed, and then you use that information to make a correction based on that. That's a little bit of a separate video, but uh, it's, it's cool to see that they've actually made a realistic representation of what shots like this would be like. So after the initial miss, our shooter makes some corrections, but in the process completely reveals himself. Now he knows his first round would have made a massive cloud of dust with that muzzle brake as we chatted about just now. And then he completely proceeds to sit up giving his enemy sniper a big nice target to aim at and then he gets picked off behind his rifle. Now a real shooter would probably have retreated, made the adjustments and probably gone to a new position so that the enemy sniper would be kept guessing as to what his position actually is. Right, so we have a new shooter on the 50. He's gonna keep engaging the guys over by the house. You'll notice on this first trigger pull of his, he's absolutely got his finger in there and he's slamming down on the trigger. Now, yes, that can be that can work at closer ranges, but when you're engaging targets super far, any little movement you put into that rifle will have a dramatic effect downrange. There is a saying, an object in motion stays in motion. So any little shift at the beginning, as the bullet flies down range, will end up being a massive shift. So you have to be super precise. So in order to make long range hits, 
the trigger pull is one of the most important aspects of long range shooting. Right, so the outer ammo and Aldrich has been tasked to retrieve the ammo from the our guy that got picked off the rifle earlier and they proceed to put the ammo into the rifle and he's trying to rack the bolt back to pick up the next round but it appears to me like the bolt's just running over the top of the rounds. Personally, I don't think that a little bit of blood in a magazine can seize up a magazine like that. Maybe, hopefully no one has had experience with that. But let me know in the comments down below what you guys think. Is that plausible? I think the spring on that 50 is going to be so strong it's going to break off everything because that thing's made to function in the worst of conditions. So I think it's just a little bit of extra drama that they've added into the scene. Blink and you'll miss this one. Jeremy Renner's character hands him a magazine which appears to be filled with empty casings. But as they cut the scene, all of a sudden the bullets are in the casings. I didn't see this at first, but when editing it, I picked it up and I thought it's pretty interesting how things like that slip by the average person. Nonetheless, they proceed to engage the guys over by the house and they manage to pick somebody off the roof. Then they see a target that's off the side to the house a little bit and this guy's absolutely just you know, like sunbathing out there in the middle, completely exposed, knowing that they're shooting back at them with a 50 caliber rifle, okay? So maybe he was, yeah, <laughs> probably not the smartest thing to do. Anyway, so the first round goes down range, they hit a little bit low. Now I'm thinking, I have actually seen this happen, that rounds actually skip off the ground and still hit their targets. And in this case, if you're hitting really close to somebody like that, there's a very real possibility that that could have happened. Nonetheless, the guy stands up, he starts booking it, and uh, the sniper manages to put a round in him, which is an absolutely great shot and could probably be a very realistic shot. Unlikely, while he's running, if you just miss, but that was pretty good shooting. So the other thing I found pretty funny was the fly actually like walking on his eyelid and almost into his eyeball. First of all, as an actor, well done for staying committed. And uh, how, like, do they have like unleash a whole bunch of flies and hope that it happens? Or do they have like a, do they CGI it? I don't know, <laughs> but it's pretty cool. Overall, I thought the scene was really cool, really fun, great movie. And um, I hope you guys enjoyed this breakdown of this scene. Moving along, let's take a deep dive into Jack Reacher, the first one, featuring one of my other favorite actors, Tom Cruise. So the opening scene in Jack Reacher, I really enjoyed. How they show the guy making the bullets, seeding everything with his press, trimming his cases. That's all something we shooters spend a ton of time doing. And knowing that they went through the effort to show us that this guy's handcrafting his ammunition was super cool. Something I did notice is the shooter actually proceeds to put on his sunglasses before he engages the targets. Now personally for myself when I shoot, even though eye protection is recommended, I tend not to shoot with eye protection because I don't want any sort of funny light or anything happening when we're doing long range shooting. Now I really liked how they showed this angle showing the actual scope picture in the middle as well as some peripheral vision that the shooter would have. One of the things we also spoke about in part one is how movies tend to get the magnification incorrect. Now we get why they do this otherwise we wouldn't see much but the magnification over this distance the people would appear much smaller in his reticle but I think it's a pretty cool shot showing us sort of to see more than just the normal optic with the blackout around the sides. I really liked how they did that. So in this scene the character is shooting civilians so I don't want to actually comment on the shooting itself. I want to comment on how the rifle recoils. As you guys know when we analyze American Sniper those rifles recoiled completely wrong whereas in this scene the recoil seems pretty realistic actually. So later in the movie Tom's character goes out to a shooting range and he gets challenged to shoot groups at 700 yards. So he goes out to hang his paper target on a steel plate. Okay now it appears that it's mild steel because there are bullet holes through it. When we shoot steel at our practice ranges or in competitions we have hardened steel AR500 and the modern calibers do very little damage to that. Now these are mild steel because you can see there are dents there are holes through them and uh, the bullets are tearing them up. So anyway, Tom hangs his paper target on there and later in the scene when he shoots his paper target, it makes these tiny little round holes through the paper. Now, I'm calling BS on that because if he's shooting the steel, despite the fact that the bullet is gonna go through the steel, there's gonna be some shrapnel and that's gonna tear up that paper target completely. So there's a little bit of a continuity error and I also don't know why Tom did the super tactical roll after having put his arm through the sling that was just to get a cool camera angle, I guess. <laughs> Enemy at the Gates. This was probably one of my first exposures to a sniper movie. My dad showed this movie to me with Vasily Zaitsev played by Jude Law many, many moons ago. I remember watching this movie as a kiddie. 
And great movie, in this opening scene, Vasily's character is seen taking out some bad guys through a tiny little aperture. I'm not going to give anything away in this movie or any movie that we chat about. You'll notice as he lines up for the shot how much movement there actually is in his rifle system when he manages to hit a clutch headshot through a tiny little aperture that he timed to a landing of a bomb to sort of mask the gunshot going off. Super, super cool scene in this movie and a super cool movie overall. I'm not going to say too much more about Enemy at the Gates, but this next scene is pretty funny and I don't think they intended it to be. So in this next scene, Vasily and his partner have to make it back to their base. However, to do that, they need to jump over this gap. So his partner decides to go first and as he does that, unknowing to them, the enemy sniper have already lined them up and he manages to shoot a clutch shot once again in the temple of our good guy. Now, as that happens, our good guy, keep in mind, he's already in motion, jumped across this gap, facing straight towards him. The bullet hits him in his temple. He proceeds to do a 90 degree turn and open his eyes and does what looks to me like a Will Ferrell impression. He looks just like Will Ferrell in this clip, but that obviously won't happen. I mean, if he gets shot, if he'd already had enough momentum to actually clear the gap, his body would still continue to clear the gap and uh, I don't see the direction turning. So that was a little bit cringe in that movie. But overall, awesome movie. If you haven't checked out Enemy at the Gates, make sure you check it out. It's a really cool old school sniper movie. And as I say, one of the first ones I really ever was exposed to. So the last movie on the list is The Accountant featuring Ben Affleck. Awesome movie. I absolutely loved it the first time I watched it. I've actually watched it again. It's a great movie. Ben's character goes out to the farm with his 50 because, you know, when you're an accountant, you can afford to go practice with your 50. And he shoots melons. Now, the farmer, like, looks through his binoculars and he looks at Ben's character and then he sort of pans to his left and he says, that must be something like a mile, okay? Looks like somebody's seen too many westerns. Yeah, must be what? A mile out? <laughs> Not on my best day. <laughs> Now, if you look at the size of Ben's melon versus the size of the actual melons once the farmer pans over with these binoculars, that means that that shot's not very far at all. Now, having said that, let's say that's where they made the error and Ben was actually shooting at a mile. To shoot the melons with a 50 BMG at a mile is doable, but you're probably going to need a little bit bigger of a target. A 50 BMG was designed to take out vehicles okay as you will see later in this movie where they actually implement it correctly but great shooting it can be done if you're gonna go three for three at melon sized targets at a mile you're a better shooter than i am but anyway this video is just for fun and great movie and a great selection of movies wouldn't you guys agree guys if you haven't done so already make sure you are subscribed down below in one of our upcoming videos we're actually gonna dissect by your request, the whole first season of Shooter, the TV series that they actually made from the movie. If you haven't checked out part one, you can do that up here. If you doubt my shooting ability, you can do that here. You can subscribe down to the channel. Make sure you leave a like so we can put a round through that PST Gen 2. I appreciate you watching. I'll see you guys in the next video.